Hello, and welcome to the 2020 series presented by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series are conversations with creative visionaries about craft, creativity, and collaboration. We're going to have 20 minutes of shop talk and then 20 minutes of answering questions from you guys, the global audience. So please do write in. My name is Liz Hinline. I am a filmmaker, artist, creative director, and creator of the 2020 series. And I am so thrilled to have one of my bestie, oldest friends who is a brilliant genius writer, songwriter, and singer, Tanuja Desai Hildier. And she is with us today. And you showed up. Yay. It's like magic. There you are. Hello. I'm the right buttons. Hi, Lizzie. Exactly. Hi. Hi. So I want to jump right into it because, you know, I'm so impressed. You know, you're a novelist, which is, it just sounds so like, like high esteem. And how did you come to writing naturally? Was this just a natural instinct of yours? I think, um, yeah, like pretty much ever since I could read, which was pretty early. I think like my parents were reading me stories and all, and I sort of like latched onto that quite early. Um, I wanted to write and the writing when I was a kid, um, I would write short stories. I would write poems. Sometimes the poems had melodies and would turn into, into songs that way. Um, and I would read everything. I would read like the serial box, the back of the cereal box, like labels on things, like anything I could get my hands on. So I think that was that was a love from really early on. And I feel like all of the sort of different um, art forms that I've been kind of drawn to over the years have been just different forms of storytelling and like ways to play with language. And in my household, um, art was very much like built into our home. So my mom, my parents actually bought a piano, a, little upright piano for my brother and me before they even furnished the living area of the first home that they owned in the US because they had a limited budget and they opted to get a piano rather than furniture. <laughs> we had like, you know, I belonged to the Nancy Drew book club and the Arrow book club at school. And that was something they really kind of um, prioritized. So books and writing and reading, my mom was always singing around the house. My brother would be playing the piano. That was always very much kind of the the environment that I was swimming in from pretty early on. And then how do you differ, do you differentiate between novel writing, songwriting, and uh, like poetry? Like, is there a different brain of yours or is it all one big soup? I feel like it's, it's one, it's one big soup in many ways. Um, in a lot of ways, I feel like, well, the two albums that I've done with my ride or die team of Marie Twayje and Adam Fellows and um, Dave Sharma produced the second album. Both of them are book tracks that are songs based on the two novels that I wrote. So the themes inevitably overlap with the themes that I was writing about in my prose. And that it was just sort of natural for me to explore those themes in songwriting in both forms, because that's what was brewing in my head. And I was like, I was in a band when I wrote the first book and I was still making music with Adam and Marie when I wrote the second book. So it was sort of natural. That was kind of always, you know, always part of the picture. And um, with the first book, we did the album that was with um, Adam and the and kind of the band that I was in in New York and Marie and the band in London. Um, I think it was like a year, two years after the first book came out, the album came out and the songwriting sort of all happened after the prose. With the second book, with Bombay Blues, the songs actually led me into the into the prose, and the process kind of started with the songwriting because I didn't know how to find my in into writing about this city I had never lived in. My first book was set in New York City, where I lived for nearly ten years. I could draw from experience. With Bombay Blues, I lived in Bombay as a baby, and subsequently made three research trips, you know, specifically for the book, and I. After those trips, I kind of came back, sat down with all my notes, the outline I had very optimistically and foolishly thought would be the same outline after visiting, after going to Bombay. And, um, and I actually didn't know how to break into the story at all. So what I did was I started by looking at photographs that I had taken as notes and reminders. The main character of both books, Dimple Lala, is a photographer. And I was also just taking photos to remember things. As I, as I kind of, you know, went around exploring the city. And um, 
the very first step to writing Bombay Blues was actually I sat down and I didn't know what to do. So I just started listing things that were in photographs I had taken. I took mm -hmm. photographs from um, Chor Bazaar, which is a flea market. It's, it's thieves market. And I started to list items like sleigh bells, doorbells, phonographs, clocks stuck back in time. And those, I could hear the melody of those words in this list of items. And um, eventually that list became the song Chor Bazaar on the album that goes with Bombay Blues. But what I did initially is I took the verses and I stuck them in the word document for the novel. And then I deversed them. Like I ran the sentences together and made them into paragraphs rather than stanzas. Right. And that's sort of how I found my way into what might happen in that scene. So they're very intertwined, the process, especially with the second book and album. And have you done, I don't even know this, have you done any screenwriting? Have you done that? that I, genre? I have, well, I don't know how happily I would share the screenwriting <laughs> that I've done, <laughs> but I, ha I have done it because I, well, I went to the New York Film Academy actually, um, Many years ago in the 90s, I did the summer intensive course there. Hi, Tim Cunningham and Vincent Lazara. Those were my crewmates. This was in the era of editing on Steenbeck's and like meeting on street corners and lugging reels around from Magno Sound, you know, before email, before digital, all of that. Um, and the short film that I, I didn't really do a, I guess I did a screenplay, yes, but it was like a short, it was a 10 minute film. And in many ways, that short film, which is called The Test, um, and it follows an Indian American character who's trying to get the results of a pregnancy test in her apartment, but doesn't realize her mom springs a sort of ambush suitable boy meeting on her. And she's trying to get the result and do the test while this meeting with this suitable um, Indian boy is happening. And in many ways that character and that experience like that sort of laid the groundwork for Born Confused for my first novel, although I didn't write it for a few, few years after. But that character was very much like a precursor, I think, to Dimple Lala, the protagonist of my books. And when I did, when it did come time to do the um, the book proposal, I actually sold both books on outlines before I'd written them. Um, so when I did the outline for Born Confused, I used what I had learned at the New York Film Academy. I had also read all the books everybody said to read, like Sid Field and Joseph Campbell and. Um, had read some screenplays. I did a screenplay writing boot camp in New York City at some point, a couple of years maybe after the New York Film Academy. And so when I did my outline, I tried to set it up like based on screenplay structure, like sort of three, six, three, three beats, six beats, three beats, act one, act two, act three. And then I kept fleshing those out to like 30 beats, 60 beats, 30 beats. And, um, and part of the reason I did that is I think I wanted to be sure, since I already had the book deal, I wanted to be sure that I knew I was going to be able to finish the project. So I wanted to make sure I could kind of see that whole arc. And ultimately, I, I think I had maybe a 25 page outline. I got it kind of to that level of detail. And um, that's what sold to Scholastic for Born Confused. And with the first book, again, because I was drawing from my, my uh, in part from my experiences in mm -hmm. New York City where I had lived, the final product was not exactly the same as the outline, but it was fairly close. Whereas with Bombay Blues, I also sold it on an outline that I wrote before beginning my research trips there. And it was like day two in Bombay for my first research trip there, that outline kind of went out the window and, <laughs> and nothing went to plan, which ends up sort of being um, the experience of, of Dimple in Bombay. At a certain point, I realized I had to, some of it's there, some of that structure, right. I needed that to begin. Right. Um, and then there was like a, a lot of kind of going with the flow for the character and sort of seeing seeing where the city would lead her. I love how you don't get stopped when you're like, okay, I didn't really know how to address the book or I didn't know really what to, you know, like that you're like, okay, let's try a different creative way of approaching it. Let's try looking at it from this different angle. And I think that seems to me that, you know, um, with your books and your music stuff you that you're you're this kaleidoscope of looking at things from multiple different angles is that just like very natural to you i think i think it is and i think what's really helpful about that i think part of it is also you know i knew i i always knew that i wanted to write i knew i wanted to write a book i got to new york city after college and i still wanted to write but i just didn't 
I think I had a lot of self-doubt and a lot of distraction because New York City, and I didn't want to be at home all the time in my apartment in front of a laptop. Like there were dance floors to <laughs> destroy, you know, there was a lot going on out there. And, um, and so I, I did write and I wrote short stories and all, but I also explored sort of, you know, maybe it's like an ultimate form of procrastination from not sitting down and writing the novel. I kind of explored, you know, uh, film and I, I was in bands in New York um, with Adam, who I've mentioned before, like IO, a punk pop band in the last uh, couple of years that I was in New York. So I was, I was kind of always staying creative, even though I was also very actively avoiding writing a novel at a certain point of time there. Um, but I think that all of those different art forms really help. Like for example, when I, when I got to the point of writing um, Born Confused, I, if I got stuck or I needed like kind of a, a portal into a scene, sometimes I would do things like, I, I typically with that book, I wrote longhand in cafes around London. Mm -hmm. We lived on Portobello Road. It was our first flat and we stayed there until the mice drew, drew us out of the house. <laughs> but um, I would go to cafes and write longhand and then I'd come home and type everything up on my chunky little laptop, like looking down at the market through the window, Portobello Market. And, um, and then usually after the mechanical act of transcribing, I'd often have gone into the next scene without even realizing it. And sometimes what I would do is, is soundtrack um, the scene and I would actually literally like play in the room of our flat the music that might be playing say at the at the Bhangra nightclub that Dimple Lala is at so maybe I'd play Malkit Singh Gurnala Nishika Mitai. Mm -hmm. At the same time if the mood or the headspace of the character is quite different even if in the scene that song might be playing maybe I would be playing Sparkle Horse or Nelly Furtado or um, or the Cardigans or PJ Harvey that kind of thing so that also helped me sort of set the scene and get in the headspace, like playing the actual music. And then I would do things, I would sort of cast the future film of the book while I was writing it, not really with any known names, especially at that time, um, there weren't that many known names to like fill up the largely, almost entirely South Asian American, mm -hmm. South Asian cast, you know, that it would be for the books. but say like there's this young woman I would always see on the Ladbroke Grove tube platform when I'd sort of head out of like the Portobello Road area. And that in my mind became Kavitha, the character of Kavitha. Right. So I think sort of looking off the page for inspiration has you know, always been helpful. And that can be art, that can be film, that can be eavesdropping on conversations, you know, just watching people on the tube, people watching. A hundred percent. Well, yeah. it's just so interesting because when one thinks about like a novelist or writer that, that you know, it's, it's a definitely internal solitary experience, but you're such a performer as well. And what does the performance, like being a performer, being in front of the crowds, you know, being in a band, what is, what itch does that scratch for you? I think he, human off page company. So a mm -hmm. collaboration also, because with the fiction writing that's, you know, that's, as you said, it's kind of like a solitary process. You, at a certain point, you feel very accompanied by your story and by your characters, but it is still at the end of the day, sitting down in front of your computer or your phone or your notebook and, you know, kind of diving in on your own. And um, all the music, like on the albums and everything, everything is collaborative. Again, like largely with Marie and Adam, also Dave, um, and I've collaborated with other people as well. And that is just utter joy. So the part of the songwriting that um, that I do is lyrics writing and melodies. So that mm -hmm. can happen in a number of different ways. Maybe the lyrics and melodies kind of come out a cappella and I record them like digitally. And then my collaborators, you know, we start to build, they start to build the music around that, or they give me like a track and I write on top of it or just a riff or that kind of thing. And the most magical of all is being in the room with them in real time and actually having things come together that way. So the, their company, like just that connection with them and that relationship with them, it's, it's just, um, it's so joyful. It's so intimate in a different way too. Like, you know, there's an intimate relationship between the reader and the writer, but you don't always meet your reader, or at least in the act of reading, you don't meet your readers. And it's kind of a, you know, kind of direct sort of like entry into some quiet internal space. Whereas with Marie and Adam, it's like human bodies like sweating and making noise in a room together. And 
I'm so inspired by them. I'm, you know, I'm their friend, they're, you know, their best friends, they're like, you know, family, but I'm also like a huge fan of everything that they do. So that is, a, that's a huge joy for me. And then of course, um, an audience like to have, that's also a collaboration. I mean, there may be some people on the stage and some in the audience, but ultimately it's the energy in the room. And it's very exciting seeing how, you know, a song that sounds one way, say in a rehearsal room, or like when you're making it up on the subway or that, I'm talking about subways a lot. I guess I miss subways, COVID. <laughs> um, in, in the room, just like how it, how it transforms and becomes something different depending on the energy in the space. And, and I love that too, like that kind of feeling of connection with a room possibly full of strangers, maybe some friends are in it. And, um, and to sort of celebrate the fruition of the work with mm. my bandmates and all, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's thrilling. It's very satisfying. All of that said, I think nothing compares to the actual, um, the making of the art. So in you know, kind of like getting in the flow with fiction and when it's music and something collaborative, like mm -hmm. those moments of, you know, the click. Exactly. Writers, I think it's the, that's sort of the highest high. A hundred percent. So I'm going to jump into a question here because this is apt to what we're talking about. So, sure. uh, Natalia asks, I would love to try to produce a short film. I feel like there is no creativity and imagination in me to come out with an interesting story. Do you have any suggestions how I could unlock my creativity? This is oh this is like your forte. Oh my God, you are so, you you definitely have a story. Was it Natalia? Yeah. Is that new? Natalia, yeah. you definitely have a story you definitely have some that something worth saying that we want to see and hear in you. And I think that, um, you know, we're all humans are storytellers. Like that is, that is what we are as humans. We're all storytellers. We're all creators. Even if you haven't quite found your, your medium yet, you're still an artist. You're an artist simply by moving through, you know, moving through time in a human body <laughs> in this world that kind of, that takes a lot of kind of thinking on your feet and artistry and bringing, bringing things together, like harmonizing things that might seem to be, um, you know, clashing or, or you know, incongruous. Um, I think like something I learned writing um, my novels is sometimes the most sort of mundane things to you might be the most interesting to a reader, like they're mundane to you because you know them so well, but that's actually wherein lies a lot of the power because you know them so well, there's an authenticity there and I would say, don't underestimate the experience that you can bring from your own life to what you write about. Um, you also don't have to feel any pressure to make it about your own life. And ultimately, by the time you write about it, even if it is about your own life, it turns into something else once you kind of put it in, in the form of film or writing, et cetera. And um, maybe, you know, writing workshops, like I found that helped me a lot in, when I was in New York, I, I did writing workshops at the Writer's Voice at the YMCA. And for me, that helped a lot to have a deadline and know that I had to deliver rather than just being in this amorphous like space of, my parents were waiting for my writing. No <laughs> for my writing. <laughs> you know, so that, that was helpful. So I would say, you know, maybe it's worth doing something like that, like kind of taking a class or, or finding a community. Um, if that's, if that feels like it would kind of go with the, your artistic flow. Um, but first of all, just turn the volume down on the voice in your head that might be saying you can't do it or you don't have something to say, like that just has to go out the door. Because mm -hmm. It's just not true, it's simply not true. So first faith in yourself and in your voice and then perhaps community, perhaps classes to do it. And another thing that helped me a lot, I when I was having a big sort of writer's block moment or actually that was my entire life up until, <laughs> up until I wrote the book. My writer, my writer blocked life in New York. Um, a friend gave me the artist's way and mm. um, I didn't do the entire thing, but this idea of the morning pages, like you get up in the morning and before your day starts, this is also sort of a luxury. Sometimes you may not be able to do this, but, um, but the idea is to sort of write anything that comes to mind, write three pages of it without judging yourself and, you're trying to sort of capture the moment before your day begins and all the busyness and I have to answer this email and I have to do this and I have to, you know, get to work, et cetera. And to kind of hold on to that sort of dream space and, and let everything flow there. That I found really helpful. And something else I've been doing to, to not lose touch with 
um, certain projects is um, there's an, a wonderful writer named Jamie Attenberg and she started this whole kind of movement called Thousand Words of Summer. And she sometimes does them these, these like sort of little writing um, kind of intensives um, more often than that. But basically you write a thousand words a day for two weeks every summer. And sometimes she does them at other points in the year. You, don't, you can do it on your own also. But I found that too, a little bit like the artist's voice. Mm -hmm that sort of helps too to just keep everything oiled and moving and put you in the act of making and like take you out of the judgmental head and just put you like right onto the page or whatever the form might be that's so great that's really great so i, I have a, to see what you make <laughs> i bet you know as you're talking i have a bigger sort of question is like what is what is why is storytelling important to you and second question is because you can look at it through through the South Asian view, from the Indian view, and from the American view. And are there different views of storytelling? Is it a, is it a different mindset, especially since it's a much older culture, mm -hmm. you know, in India for storytelling and and the reasoning for storytelling, the, the the importance of it. And I just wanted to get some of your any thoughts on that. Yeah. No. I think I feel like. I mean, I shouldn't make grand generalizations about the world, but I feel like the impulse to storytell must be the same across cultures with all humans, which is to, you know, to embrace and carry forward what's come before, which is very important, kind of like oral tradition. And, you know, for me, um, with my books, like part of what I wanted to do well, part of what I wanted to do was fill a hole on my own childhood bookshelf because my parents were the first to immigrate from both sides of their family. Um, they had a love marriage, an out of caste love marriage at a time when their states were at war. We were the first people of our particular diasporic brown in the town that I grew up in. And um, people like my family were just not visible on bookshelves and you know, on the movie screen, on TV and magazines, toys, dolls, Barbies, like all of that kind of stuff. And, um, and I myself, actually, even though I wrote all the time from when I was very small, I didn't realize until I was in my 20s that I always wrote white characters. So, you know, that whole kind of uh, lack of representation in our lives off page had translated into a lack of representation, even in my own imagination, when I would daydream, when I would like make up bands and draw people and write stories and later short stories or whatever it might be. And so I feel like it's, it, I wanted to fill that hole on my childhood bookshelf and I wanted to honor my family's diaspora journey and kind of bring that forward into the present moment. And then also explore like, you know, the character is finding her place in this whole sort of like multicultural South Asian American um, space. And for me, I kind of wrote my way into, into finding my space through her journey. And um, a, a, a wonderful sort of lesson learned or gift in the process was discovering that this hyphen of, you know, being Indian American, whatever your hyphen may be, and we're all hyphenated at some point, what, you know, if you go back enough, far enough, or we're hyphenated people simply by being people who have various drives and desires that we're always trying to bring into balance, mm -hmm. you know, just as human beings. And, um, I kind of had spent a lot of time feeling I wasn't Indian enough to tell an Indian story. I wasn't American enough to tell an American story. Like I was, you know, 50, 50 uh, on either side of my hyphen and through the making of the art and sort of um, following Dimple through her journey, I started to see that that hyphen does not have to be a border. It can also be a bridge and we can be 100%, 200%, whatever we are on either side mm -hmm. of it. We can live on the hyphen, we can live on the bridge, um, you know, it's, it's not binary or either or. And mm -hmm. I feel like our stories allow that space. They, they kind of allow us to live on the bridge. They allow us to get past the kind of binary and into like the, the layers and the richnesses and the nuances, et cetera. And not only do does storytelling help us, you know, preserve our stories and kind of share them, like, you know, relay them. I mean, it's a relaying and a relay kind of like stories getting passed on through time, I feel like we actually can shift and shape our futures and, and reality with our use of language. Um, you know, 
the word undocumented <laughs> for you know what I mean like if you, if you just make a shift in language it's a shift in perception and then that perception can create a shift in tangible reality like whatever that is <laughs> so I feel like um storytelling it's yes it's the way of kind of holding on to things but it's also a way of creating things and forming things and and shaping our own narratives and you know kind of getting to decide a, a bit like what our stories are going to be as well as what they are and what they've been. I love that. I love that. Um, Tim asked, do you write every day? Is that Tim Cunningham? That is Tim Cunningham. Tim, you're not supposed to ask how the writing's going. <laughs> so Tim, Tim was my crewmate at New York Film Academy all those years ago in the 90s. And he um, he directed the Heptonesia music video for the second album in the second book. And um, he's like involved in the Deep Blue She video, et cetera. So do I write every day? I guess I, 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 guess I have been writing every day um, more recently. I wouldn't say that's always the case. Like during the pandemic, after moving back to the States um, after 17 years in the UK, and we're now in Maine in a three generation household, um, during the pandemic, with everybody at home uh, all the time and just like the world and everything. I was having trouble kind of accessing that daydreamy part of my brain. And that's mm -hmm. where kind of that, those morning pages and the thousand words of summer I was talking about. I, I always kind of found a way to stay connected, but sometimes there were definitely long gaps in between while I screamed in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> or sobbed in the shower, you know, especially like 2020 and all. Um, now I think I am, yeah, I am writing a little bit every day. I'm, I'm sort of writing shorter pieces. I'm writing a lot about my mom, who I'm missing very much. Um, so kind of shorter pieces, like rec kind of recollections and, and different sort of things honoring, mm. honoring her journey and just, uh, bits about our story. And then I've got a, short story I'm working on for an anthology that's coming up and and still kind of tinkering away at the third in the Dimple Lala series, as well as a few other, a few other things on various burners in the back and in the front, like kind of rotating at different times. You're cooking. You're in the kitchen. Cooking. I am cooking. You're in the kitchen. You're in the kitchen. So I'm gonna jump to the deep blue she and let's just give me a little quick rundown of what where that was inspired from, what that was about, and then we're gonna play some of it. Okay, that's great. So Deep Blue She, so the song um, Deep Blue She is from Bombay Spleen, which is the book track album um, I made with Marie and Adam and Dave Sharma and John Faddis and Neil Murgai and some other guest artists on there, Gora Vaz. Um, and that's the album based on book two, Bombay Blues. And that song, um, I wrote it with Marie Tuéje and it's like kind of a revision of a, a sailor went to sea and the intention was kind of to write a modern day feminist, um, LGBTQ, queer, human rights, empowerment themed kind of dance track, um, a kind of call to rise up and love our daughters more and, uh, and love who we love, be who we wanna be, make room for each other, celebrate each other, et cetera. And then with the, um, the remix, which is the video, so it's the deep blue she, um, mutiny to unity, me to we mix remix mm -hmm. and the the concept for that video so tim who directed heptonesia and who just asked me how the writing's going um yeah. if i'm writing every day he we were sitting around in a cafe in, in london and thinking what should the next video be from the album and tim was like oh well, why don't we do deep blue chic because it's a very dancey different kind of track it can kind of show the range of the album and then he said he had this idea that maybe we could just get our friends in different places to like dance around to the track and, and film themselves. So that was a cool idea, the seed was planted. And then um, November, 2016, a certain election result came in. I was in London still, so it was like the morning. And um, I spent the morning kind of giving a pep talk to my daughters who were incredulous as they were getting in their little uniforms to go to school in London. And um, and I kept kind of telling them because they, they were like, how can this happen? You know, and I just kept reassuring them that whenever something like this happens, a piece of positive force always rises up to push, mm -hmm. to push back and like to take up space. And I kind of, you know, kept that whole chat up the whole way, like around Alexandra Palace and Muswell Hill until they were at school. 
Then I came home and sat down and like burst into tears at the kitchen table. And then I just thought I'd have to do what I told them and make a little piece of positive force to push back. And um, that idea Tim had, like then that came back to mind. And then I thought, you know, what about asking, you know, what about taking this moment that was a very low moment and flipping it and thinking, you know, why don't we celebrate our communities and people of color and women and queer communities and our born family, our found family, and make this a celebration of all of these people as a response. And I started reaching out to people that day. And um, over the course of almost a year, it the project kept growing. Initially, I thought, okay, we'll do this and we'll put it together like in a month. But then it felt really important to be as inclusive as possible and to to just make sure to make the, you know, make the video like really reflective of the richness of the world we inhabit. And so in the end, it took 364 days to complete and more than a hundred artists and activists are in it, including you. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, it's all filmed on our phones, on cell phones for the most part by us with the idea being, you know, we choose the angle, we choose the frame, we choose the lighting, we do the dance, like we decide. And, um, and there's uh, also footage from various women's marches, like in London, New York, um, from Standing Rock. And um, most of the 100 plus artist activists are, are women of color. And the project was edited. Oh my God, and that was quite a job. Thank you, Adam. Adam Fellows edited the project. Yes. Um, Sharma produced the remix. Marie, it's the song that Marie and I wrote. And we put it we put it out there in, in the world then. And it, and it was a, in a way I started it out to like follow up on, like to kind of stand by my words to my daughters and also kind of to cheer myself up. And it ended up just feeling really, really powerful and reassuring to kind of center these voices and just see what a force we are and how many of us there actually are who are kind of one hundred percent. It's super euphoric, and I'm so happy to be included in it for a small second. Let's, um, Charlie. Let's play it down if we could, please. Why 
boy, they how who can be? The city's still divided now that reclamation be. They have a lot to make me crazy. Dowry, sati, safety. If you the goddess, why the girl not safe upon your streets? And they don't want our hurricane level. great tune is so awesome and catchy. thank you for and being in the video yes were you on the tube where were you doing most of that <laughs> and how did you do that did you have like playback how did you like it mm, bernard my husband filmed it um on the bus and on the tube and actually that part on the tube it was you know i was at the end of the carriage or the car and it was full at the other end but i guess that's city life and nobody then you it. nobody did anything music while you were there um i was did i i think i had it in headphones okay um i think it was in headphones um but i was sort of like spinning around the poles on the subway cart and that whole kind of thing but yeah people kind of let it happen so that was great and um what was really kind of fun too is there was original art created for the project and um and then jazz Charanjiva, she's amazing street well, she's an artist and also street artist in Bombay. And that whole kind of stretch at the beginning, she's pasting up her pink lady, don't mess with me, street art in Bandra in India. So that was kind of cool too, to have. Fantastic. And did she do the animation? The animation is Nina Paley mm -hmm. at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. It looked really good. Really. So it's a whole family affair. Absolutely. Global family affair yeah. is really, really wonderful. So Tunisia, sadly, we're at time. Oh, well, my cough drop worked. Exactly. I'm so excited. Oh. Tunisia had a little <laughs> bit of a cough, but she yes. suppressed it very well <laughs> through drugs. Um, thank, thank you so much. This was such, such a joy. So and where, it was such a nice circle with the New York Film Academy as well, because that really was part of it. That whole experience did play a, a really vital role in my whole creative path. So thank you. A hundred percent. So where can people seek you out or ah, um, check I'm, you out? I guess I'm on Instagram and those sorts of things. Uh, this is tanuja.com is my website, although it might not have been updated in a little while. Other, but the all the links to social are there. Mm -hmm. So it's this is Tanuja. T a n u j a dot com. Yeah, he's got it, Charlie. Oh, um, thank, thank you, Charlie. You. Well, that's awesome. And your Instagram is what? Your IG. 
I think it's my full name. So it's Tanuja Desai Idea. So it's T A N U J A D E S A I and then H I D I E R. Or it's either that or this is Tanuja. <laughs> we'll they'll figure it out. They're smart yes. people. They're smart people. <laughs> This is yeah, it's been awesome and so happy, and it was just so grateful that you've been in my life for so many years. I feel the same way, and actually, that film from the New York Film Academy indirectly led me to you because it was when it screened at these different film festivals that I met Jenu, and then we worked on They See Vibe together. Exactly, exactly. All those years ago. Back in the day. So thank you, everyone. This is the last 2020 of the season. We will see you next year and just everyone be healthy. Yes. It's, you know, been an intense year, but we're really excited about 2023 and um, happy holidays. Happy holidays.